God bless everybody. Welcome back to another Bible teaching. This is Brother Shaman here from Sharpening Fellowship, and I'm just going to be going over the topic of forgiveness. Now, as we go into this topic of forgiveness, this is something that many people are sensitive to because there's a lot that have not forgiven their enemies. There's a lot that have bitterness and envy inside of their hearts, and they just refuse to let it go for whatever reason. And we want to be very respectful because we know that there are people that have been molested, people that have been raped, people that have had family members die and things happened that were very unfortunate. But there is absolutely no reason for us to have unforgiveness in our hearts because it displeases God and it separates us from God. So we're going to touch on not only why forgiveness is necessary, but we're also going to speak on why and how a person can forgive how a person can move on from traumatic experiences that have happened in their lives because God cares about every detail that we've ever been through, every second that we've ever experienced, God is invested in. And he wants us to just acknowledge the fact that just because something bad has happened to us, it doesn't give us legal rights to say, I'm never going to forgive that person or I hate that person or mm -mm. God wants us to heal. You know, he's a God that is a healer. So let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we just want to say thank you so much for this day, Lord. We just want to pray for your anointing to come upon me right now from on high and help me to teach a message and to speak the life of God to those that are listening, Lord. And we just want to pray that you cleanse us of all unforgiveness, all bitterness, all envy, and we pray that you free us from anything that is holding us back from getting closer to you. God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord that you will cleanse us of everything that is not of you. All unrighteousness, all spiritual dirt and turmoil, God, just take it from us now, Lord. Help us to be washed and sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the word in which you've spoken. We bind the forces of darkness and we pray in the name of Jesus that your word will go forth and consume as fire all things that are not of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to try not to move as much because my camera is on a shaky table. So if you see me stagnant, I'm not moving like a robot. I just don't want to disrupt the live and I want the quality to be as best as it can be for those that are viewing. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, I'm going to start here. It says this, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. I know it's King James Version, so it seems a little hard to interpret, but I'm going to elaborate. I'm going to read the next verse. Verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So we see here plainly that Satan, he has devices, plural. He has many. But the one device that we're going to focus on today that is from the enemy is unforgiveness. And unforgiveness, it allows Satan, the enemy, the devil, to absolutely destroy and to wreak havoc in our lives unnecessarily. So many times we'll be going through spiritual warfare. Many times we'll be having all of these hardships, a multitude of them, and they could be unavoid they could be avoidable if we pay attention to this key topic, forgiveness. Now, I'm not saying that anyone is bound by anything. I'm not accusing anyone of having unforgiveness in their hearts. But sometimes if you're going through a season where you, you just can't get a breakthrough, no matter what happens, something bad is always happening to you. There's always just chaos and confusion and you just can't seem to catch a break. One thing that you could do, a strategy that you could use in spiritual warfare is to ask God to search your heart and to see if there is any unforgiveness that has been rooted there. Because unforgiveness is going to invite the enemy into your life in all aspects of it. And it's going to give him legal right to do whatever it is that he desires to do within your circumstances. So if you want to stop Satan and stop unnecessary spiritual warfare, if you want to put an end to avoidable spiritual injuries and mishaps and unfortunate events, 
please ask God to search your heart and to remove any unforgiveness because this is how he reigns. When you say, I'm not forgiving a person or I hate that person, I don't want anything to do with them forever. I want them to have a terrible experience in life. You are basically saying, devil, come into my life do whatever you want to me. And we know, according to John 10.10, 10, that the enemy, he comes, but to steal, to kill and destroy. You'll start to notice that your joy is starting to get stolen from you. You'll start to notice that opportunities that the Lord wanted you to have, they get stolen. And you'll even begin to experience how your happiness in the Lord, your fervent zeal for God will begin to die and to be totally destroyed. And it's because of unforgiveness that's in your heart. And that's one of the reasons why many Christians, many saints, they fall away from the faith. They fall away from following God. They say, why is it so hard for me to fast? Why is it so hard for me to worship? Why is it so hard for me to fellowship? Why is it so hard for me to do spiritual disciplines and responsibilities? It could be because unforgiveness is stored up inside of your soul and it needs to be yanked out in order for you to live a fruitful and edifying life. All right. Now, I also wanted to add, this is an indication that there's unforgiveness in your heart. I'm going to be going through several indications that unforgiveness may be working within you. So number one, constantly thinking about how bad you want someone to experience uh trial. You're constantly thinking, I want payback. I want this person to feel how I felt. I want this person to experience something really evil. I want them to, that's all unforgiveness. That's what that's saying. And the thing is, the Bible tells us that vengeance is of the Lord. So it's the Lord that pays back what someone is due in terms of their behavior or their you know, outcomes, or whatever it is, it's the Lord that's going to determine what happens to them. Vengeance is his. So if someone does something wrong to you, it's God's duty to pay them back for what they did because we do reap what we sow. And he is the avenger. He is the one that's going to carry out justice and judgment. It's him. It's not us. So when we try to put ourselves in a position to put someone down or to judge them according to what they've done to us, we are basically saying that we know better than God. We make ourselves a God. And this violates the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We basically say, we're God, we know what should happen to them, let them get hurt, let them go through this. But that's not the case, we need to humble ourselves and we need to put all things into the hands of God. If you have a burden, if you have anxiety, if you have a care, if you have something that is weighing you down, something that's constantly on your mind, the Bible says to cast it upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll give you rest. He'll give you peace. He'll take care of you, right? So if you're ever going through that where you say, how come nothing happened to the person that killed my son? How come this, we, first of all, we don't know what's happening because we're not there with them 24 seven. And also God's plans are a lot better and more effective than the plans that we may have in terms of justice and judgment, all right? Now, I also wanted to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Understand? So here it's basically saying that God, he is the one to sit down with us, to wipe away our tears. He's the one to sit down with us and to say, I know how you feel. I understand what you're going through. He's that person that will pat us on the back, cheer us up, give us the things that we need to move on. And I say that because sometimes when we go through pain or when we go through a, a point of life where we're upset and we feel defeated because we don't think justice has been given to us, God is there in that moment 
and he's the one to go to first with our complaints. He's the person to go to first with our supplications. It's him. And he's willing to help us. When we read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, give me some time to flip there. I'm going to explain. But God is there to help us. He's there to sustain our souls, to give us rest in our minds where we feel as if we're going crazy and insane or where we're, we're just filled up with rage because we feel as if we've been wronged and nothing has been done about it. Jesus Christ, he wants us to acknowledge this one point. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, this is what it reads. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus Christ, he's able to sympathize with us. He's able to relate to us in a personal way where he's experienced all things that we've experienced, all things that we're going to experience, all things that we even didn't experience. Jesus Christ is relatable. And he's saying how he will comfort us. He will protect us. He will give us the knowledge and the guidance that we need. But in the midst of us feeling unforgiveness, in the midst of us feeling angry and furious at what someone has done to us or what some, something that's happened, He's saying that we can't sin just as he didn't sin when he was being crucified on the cross, just as when he was being arrested for something he didn't do, just as when he was being spit on in the face, face, when he was being beat, when he was being rejected by his own family, when he didn't have a place to lay his head, he didn't sin. And Jesus wants you to know that that's possible for you as well. You can be mad and angry that you've been raped before. You can be extremely furious that your baby didn't make it, you had a miscarriage. You could be livid that someone in your family was killed and they still haven't found the killer or they let the killer off the hook. You have every right to be angry. You have every right to be mad. You have every right to be frustrated with the way that life is. You do. You have every right to lift up your voice and to scream and say that life isn't fair. But what Jesus wants you to know is, although you have that right from heaven to be angry with how things are going in your life, you still have the mandate to not sin. And how you not sin in those moments is you ask God for help. You ask God for strength because his strength is made perfect in your weakness. You ask God to lead you in the way of everlasting. You say, God, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm livid. I don't wanna go through this, I hate this. I just wanna punch a hole through the wall. I just wanna go crazy. I wanna just do all of these things. You say that to God. And as you say it to God, that's a form of you casting that burden onto him and him taking it off you and exchanging that burden for his yoke, which is easy, with his burden for which is light. He's giving you joy, he's giving you peace, he's giving you rest. But before that happens, you have to give him all of the anger and resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness that you have. It's an exchange. So when you're feeling these ways, these negative emotions, give that to Jesus, fall on your knees and say, look, this is what I'm dealing with. God is real. He's not some fake priest or some false pastor that's telling you every day of your life, you have to be happy. Every day of your life, you have to have joy. Every day in your life, you have to do that. He's not some false pastor that has no sense of reality. He's the God of the universe. He knows that you are going to feel the way that you feel sometimes. He himself wept. He cried. He was emotional. He was sad at times. He was rejected. Even when we look at the prophets, I've been studying the book of Jeremiah lately. Jeremiah was slapped in his face for doing the right thing. Joseph, he was sent to jail for doing the right thing, fleeing from sexual immorality. Jeremiah put to jail for prophesying and speaking the word of God. Slapped in his face. The prophets and Jesus Christ himself, they went through such betrayal and such dishonesty within their community and even their own family. The Bible says that Jeremiah's family, they would 
talk bad about him and they would lay wait to kill him. So I'm saying all this to say there is an escape. Every temptation and every trial that you go through, God is going to give you an escape plan. And that escape plan is falling down and submitting to him and resisting the devil and making him flee. Because that is what the enemy wants. And your, your flesh, that's what it wants too. It wants you to sin in those moments. But there's a way out. There's hope. And that hope is found in our creator. Remember that he is the potter and that we're the clay. He designed us. He knows how many hairs are on our heads. He knows how we're going to feel in the next 10 years, the next five seconds. What's a, He knows what gets us mad. He knows what triggers us. Let's stop being so religious thinking I have to hold it all together and I can't get mad. Or let's stop being so lukewarm where we say, mm, God, he knows. Now I'm mad and I'm, I'm about to punch something and do this and you start cursing. No, we have to have a balance. We have to say, God, this is how I feel. This is why I feel this way. And I need you to help me. We can't just fly off the hinges. And we also can't bottle it all in as if it doesn't affect us. We need to express and vent how we feel. But it's how we do it. We go to the secret place. We go to God. And we, we let that out on him first. And then if God tells us to go to godly counsel, in which I believe he will, if he tells us to go to more mature believers or to someone else, then we share it with them as well. But God, you want to go to him with your problems first. That unforgiveness, he's the only one that can uproot that. No one else can. No health books, no nutrition books, no self-help but none, none, none of that. No motivational speeches, no TED Talks are able to pull up the root of unforgiveness. It's only God himself. No one else is strong enough to do it except for the anointing of God that will break yokes. All right? Now, I wanted to move on to this claim. This is my third point. My first point was found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11 that said that unforgiveness, it gives the enemy territory in your life. My second point was in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. And I was expounding on how God comforts us in the days of our affliction. And my third point, my final point, is going to be how if we do not forgive, then there is no forgiveness of sins. No forgiveness, no salvation. And I'm going to explain my views on that. And this is a non-negotiable. This is something that we don't mess around with and say, oh, that's your interpretation. There is only one interpretation for this specific passage of scripture found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. There is none else but only one. And it says here, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So this is pretty clear cut and simple. There are many woke pastors and people that are so puffed up with knowledge that they will say, oh, no, that doesn't mean that. You still can go to heaven. You know, you just you deal with unforgiveness. No, the Bible is clear cut. There are some things that only have one interpretation and one meaning and are not meant to be altered in any way, shape or form. This is one of those verses. This is a warning directly from God. Why else would he put it here? He says, if you do not forgive other people of their trespasses against you and against others, then you yourself will not be forgiven. So that means that if you were to have unforgiveness and resentment towards anyone in your heart and then you die, you'll stand before God and he will not allow you into heaven, but instead will cast you away into hell. This is very serious. We live in a generation where we are heaping up pastors and ministers that only tell us what our itching ears want to hear. They tell us, oh, if you for if you don't forgive, that's all right. God is just work. No, absolutely not. If you don't forgive, you're in danger of eternal hellfire. So it's very important that we go over this topic. So number one, I want to say this. Just because someone reads the Bible, just because someone goes to church and they dress nicely or they pray, they fellowship, they fast. That does not mean that they don't have unforgiveness in their heart. You can do all of these things and unforgiveness can still be rooted right within you. And it will manifest when someone says a name that you don't like. You just can't seem to give them grace. You are quick to jump to the negative. That could be a form of unforgiveness. Now, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, 
Jesus speaks about the Pharisees and he calls them the children of the kingdom originally. And he says that they will be cast into hell. Now, this is important for us to expound on because the Pharisees, they were religious scholars. They studied the word. They knew it in and out. They fasted twice a week. It's actually more than I do. I do once a week. They fasted twice a week and they would participate in many religious responsibilities and disciplines. But yet Jesus said that they would go to hell. And he said the reason that they would go to hell is more than one, obviously, hypocrisy and taking money and being lovers of money. But this could also apply to the average day believer as well. They can do all the things that the Pharisees did, and it can look so pleasing in the sight of human beings. But God, he sees and searches our hearts. If there's unforgiveness there, as we're fasting, as we're worshiping, as we're fellowshipping, as we're reading the Bible, even as we're teaching the scriptures, there is no forgiveness of sins. So it's very important for us to always pray, God, grant us repentance, expose the deep hidden things within my heart and bring them to the surface and help me to forgive. All right. And we're going to go over how to forgive later. But again, I'm going to bring some indications of unforgiveness. Number one, that's what they get. They deserved it. He got it coming to him. Now, if you are someone that has said these things in the past, all you do is just repent and you ask God for forgiveness and he'll remove that from you and he'll forget about it. But in Proverbs chapter 17, verse seven, it says in the latter part of the verse that if you take joy in someone's calamity, if you take joy and you're happy that someone is failing in life, then you won't go unpunished. That means that there is a punishment that is coming from you and is sent from heaven if you take joy in someone else falling. Now, I'm not talking about if your country is in war and your country wins the war and you're excited, you're joyful because you no longer hear bombs outside of your house and you no longer have to worry about your son or your daughter or your husband that's been sent away to fight in a war. I'm not saying that. Those are things that God, he sympathizes with us, he understands. But I'm saying if you have a personal thought about someone going through a trial or going through absolute hell on earth and you're happy about that oh they went broke i'm so happy they went broke they didn't know what to do with their money anyway oh i'm so happy that they're poor now they can't eat now that's what they get that is what they get mm -hmm. i'm so glad they lost their job now it's going to be so hard for their family this just feels so good to me if that is your attitude you will be punished eventually and i pray that it's not eternal punishment in hell so if that's your attitude again just repent Say, God, I repent for saying those things. I turn away from those. I change my mind about the way that I spoke about a particular person in terms of the well-being of their lives. And I pray now in the name of Jesus that you will help me to overcome that spirit and feeling of unforgiveness and help me to forgive and to walk in the forgiveness in which you yourself did, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. You want to pray that way. Jesus was a forgiver, okay? Even on a cross, remember what he said. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So this is the total opposite of the explanation or example that I just gave, how people are taking joy in other people's calamity. Jesus, he didn't take joy in it. Instead, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's how we ought to walk. Pray for those that despitefully use us. Be nice and kind to those that treat us evil and to always count others as more significant than ourselves. All right. Now, Proverbs chapter 24, verses 17 through 18, the Bible says this, if you are someone that is having a pleasant feeling and you're just joyous, you're happy, you're woo excited that someone else is going through a hard time. The Bible says here in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17 through 18, that God will actually look at your happiness and he'll pull his wrath away from that person. So let's give a practical example. If I'm someone that's at my job and I don't like a coworker for whatever reason it may be and they get fired and I'm chanting, yeah, yeah, they got fired, woo. They're gonna be broke forever. Yeah, that's what they get. Now they can suffer. That's what they get, mm-hmm. Yup, he had it coming to him. God will look at my behavior and then he'll go to that person that just lost their job and he'll pull his wrath away from them and he'll bless them instead. He'll 
take away that circumstance and situation of them being jobless and then he'll give them a better job than they had before that's possible with god all right and we read that in proverbs chapter 24 verse 17 through 18 so that's something that you really want to pay attention to god doesn't desire that anyone perishes he doesn't desire that anyone goes through a rough time that's not what he wants remember god is focused and invested on the point that all human beings will come to repentance and that they will live God doesn't want any bad thing to happen to anyone. Instead, he wants them to repent and to live a holy and sanctified life, which is good. Okay, now I'm um, moving on to my fourth segment. Now, this is the healing portion. This is where we receive healing from God. All right. So number one, the Bible says you ask God and you shall receive. So if there's anything that you're dealing with in terms of unforgiveness, you want to ask God right now. Say, God, I pray that you search my heart. And I pray that you help me to forgive all of those that I may have treated with bitterness and resentment and anger and hatred. And I just pray right now that you help me to forgive. And then if he brings a person to your remembrance, then you say, God, I choose to forgive so-and-so in the name of Jesus. I choose to forgive so-and-so for doing this to me in the name of Jesus. This is how you want to pray. And it's very effective. There's power in the tongue. There's power of life and death. You speak life and you speak freedom over yours when you repent and you forgive. Okay. Now, when I say forgive, I don't mean become best friends with. I'm not saying that you have to be really close to the person that you're choosing to drop that resentment towards. I'm not saying that you have to be really friendly and happy and joyful and inviting to the person that raped you. I'm not saying that you have to go hug and go love the person that killed one of your family. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that you have to let go of all negative emotions and attitudes towards that person, not only in your mind, but also in your conduct. So if you see them, you don't treat them with disdain. You don't treat them with disrespect, but instead you hold your peace and you strive to make peace, right? So that's something that I wanted to add. And I'm going to give some biblical ground for this. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 39. Paul and Barnabas, they separated. And they had a sharp disagreement. I'm not going to expound on what it says other than the fact that they had a sharp disagreement and they separated. And it was because Paul wanted to take um, one of the disciples and then Barnabas wanted to take a different disciple and they separated. So sometimes... For you to forgive someone, you're going to have to separate because you obviously don't get along. You know that God isn't calling you to journey with that person in life. So just separate. It's not a big deal. This is something that Lot and Abraham did as well. When their herdsmen and the camps that they had around them, they were fighting. They were getting into stuff. They were always arguing. Abraham, he, separ he separated away from Lot. But when he heard the news that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot lived, he prayed, then he interceded for Lot. And he said, no, save his life. Let there, is there 50 righteous there? Is there 40 righteous there? Is there 25? Is there one? And God saved the Lot's life. But it was through Abraham's prayer. Now, Abraham could have said, oh, no, I separated from him. Mm -mm. I don't want nothing to do with him anymore. That's not the case. You have to still have that attitude of grace and mercy towards those who have let you down. So, for example, if you separate from somebody that you don't really get along with, that doesn't mean that you are not forgiving them. It just means that you keep, you're keeping your boundaries, you're keeping your peace. But keeping your peace and having boundaries, you still can pray for them. You still can be nice to them. If they're going through a time where they don't have money to pay their rent, you can help out. If they're going through a season where they don't have food, you can give them food, help out, understand? So unforgiveness, or let me rephrase that, forgiveness is not you separating as in you acting as if they've fallen off the face of the earth. Forgiveness is separating from the person that you know God has not called you to walk with and still having a positive and godly mindset toward them and be willing to help them out when they're in need. All right. David and Saul. Saul tried to kill David multiple times. David avoided Saul. He ran away from Saul. So there are going to be people in your life that you still are able to forgive. I forgive you, but you know that their presence is nothing but trouble. You know that their presence can turn you away from the Lord or try to turn you away from the Lord or even try to physically harm or kill you. So therefore, you avoid them. You get restraining orders. You 
move away. You don't tell them your location. You don't text them. You don't talk to them as much. If they try to call you, you don't answer because you already know that they're a threat to your well-being and your survival. That's totally fine. But you can't have disrespect towards them. You can't say, oh, I wish they'll die. Oh, I hate them. I would just want to kill them. Mm -mm. If you do have those thoughts and if you want to talk like that, go to God and speak like that. Don't say it around anyone else. You go to God and say, God, I really want this person dead. Or I really, and it's not you speaking a spell, it's you speaking your mind. And it's better that you speak your mind to God than you speak it to a vulnerable human being that has emotions and feelings and they can take that a certain way and get you to go to jail or you know whatever. But you go to God and you cast the burden before him. Say, God, and this is the thing, most people have never dealt with this before. So they're saying, oh no, I'll never. You never know until you get in a situation, but there was a time where, you know, I was being chased and followed and a person had a gun and I thought my I thought I was going to die. So I said, Lord, help me. Don't let me die like this. Don't let me go like this. I don't think I said any. I, I did ask God. I said, stop him. Stop him in some way. Stop him in some shape or form. This is when I first got saved and God stopped him, you know, but to this day, I when he comes to my remembrance, I pray, I say, God, forgive him of the sins. Don't let him die and go to hell. You know, so just know if you have thoughts and emotions, deep trauma of hurt and pain, go to God with that. And we read the book of Psalms. David was praying that God would kill his enemies. And I'm not saying that that's a, a strategy that you should use as a New Testament and born again believer. But what I'm saying is, I know that God, he knows your heart. He sees your heart. You go to him and you express how you feel and just let it out. Don't keep it bottled up inside of you, right? But bottom line, David avoided Saul at all costs. He ran from him. And another thing to add is that he didn't disrespect him in that, in that uh, period. As he's running away to save his life from Saul, he didn't disrespect Saul. In fact, the person that killed Saul, David had that man killed. And he said, how could you touch the Lord's anointed? And this is just the mindset that we have to have. Not that the person who is trying to kill us or the person that really hates our lives is the Lord's anointed, but we have to view them as someone that is made in God's image and after his own likeness. And we have to have the mindset that God has towards that person, which is repent and live instead of rebel and die, right? Now I'm gonna end with this. The Bible says, without peace and holiness, no one will see the Lord. So if you're not striving to make peace with people, and to be holy in conduct and in speech, then there's, let me, let me get out of that woke mindset and that fragile mindset. This is what the Bible says, without peace and holiness, you won't see the Lord. So if you're not striving to make peace and living in holiness by conduct and speech, you won't see God, simple. You will not be saved, you will not go to heaven. And this is not coming off of your own works or your own strength, but instead it's coming from asking God to help you to fulfill what he said in his word, because he'll do it. If you ask according to his word and not amiss, then he will grant your prayer request. If you say, God, help me to make peace and to be holy so that I can see you, he's going to do it. It's a work of his spirit, right? And also the Bible says, if possible, make peace with all men. So if it's possible for you to be friends, with the person that you struggle to forgive, be friends with them. If it's not possible because of barriers that they put up or emotional flaws and attitudes that they have towards you, then let bygones be bygones. I don't even know if that's a, a term that I should use, but just let the Lord handle it, all right? So praise God, praise God. All right, that's the end of my short teaching today. I love you guys. And I just wanted to go over some announcements. So. I'm part of Sharpening Fellowship. We are a discipleship ministry. And if you want to join us, and if you want to fellowship with us, then please send me a direct message. My direct messages are open, but I'll send you the link for you guys to come in and to get more teachings. In Sharpening Fellowship, we have prayer every single night, prayer meetings at eight o'clock Eastern time for 15 minutes every single night. We also have Bible studies every Tuesday. I'm sorry, we have Bible studies every Thursdays and Sundays and all throughout the week spontaneously. So if you would love to do that, please just hop on. We have an online ministry for those that are not in the area. And we also have the physical ministry here in the area of Philadelphia, where we also evangelize and we go out, we preach the gospel. You can see it on my YouTube page. I have it in my link. 
on TikTok. But again, if you are looking for fellowship that is healthy, fellowship that is anointed, and fellowship that is after God's own heart, then we invite you to join us and to serve with us. So you can send me a direct message on TikTok if you'd like to become a part of our journey with the Lord as we minister and serve. And also, yeah, I'm. this is on TikTok. So yeah, amen. I'm gonna stop talking here, but God bless. I gotta go to another Bible study right now. Praise God. Thank you guys for coming.